one of the parables the Lord Jesus talked about was how a strong man keeps his house in order. And that parable is about the devil being the strong man, keeping all in his house, kept by him, guarded by him, until a stronger man comes and binds him and then takes. And this is a lot of what happens in the Christian life, in this fallen world. And what, what we see with, because of the result of sin and, and people's blindness and captivity to sin and Satan, we need a stronger one to come and to save and to redeem. And that's what we have in our Savior. You know, before I get into the text here, we, I like to think and, and just say we cannot have too high of an estimation or valuation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is. You can overvalue a person, a relationship. You can overvalue a house or a business or a stock. Things can get overvalued, right? But with the Lord Jesus, he's so great, so wonderful, so good, you cannot even fathom how worthy, valuable, and wonderful he is as our God and as our Savior. So today I wanted to talk to you about what, what the Lord's teaching through Hebrews chapter 8 in this section on, on this new covenant. And from, I want to read Hebrews 8, 10 through 12, these three verses, and then I want us to look at what, what we have from this today. So Hebrews chapter 8, starting in verse 10, he's, the author to the Hebrews says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Amen. This is the word of God for us today. And in this portion of the letter to the Hebrews, the author is quoting the prophet Isaiah from hundreds of years back. And he's saying, Jeremiah is saying, The days are coming, declares the Lord when I will establish a new covenant. This is, this is monumentally massive in our lives and in their lives, this new covenant that came in. And it was not like the old covenant when he made the, with the father, fathers in the days when he took them by the hand, he said, and took them out of Egypt, led by Moses. Remember all of that, that glorious, wonderful aspect of that deliverance out. There's a big difference, a big difference in this covenant. And the thing is, all true believers today, right here in this room, and in Texas, and in Indonesia, and all over the world, they need to understand, they have to realize that the new covenant has been completed or accomplished, sealed, first and foremost, with the Lord Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? The old covenant was God on the mountain with Moses up there and saying, tell them if they do this, if they do that, right? The Ten Commandments, if they don't lie, if they honor me, if they, if they don't steal, if they don't covet, if they don't do all these things, then they can live in the land and they can thrive. And I will not bring these covenant curses upon them. It's different now. The covenant now is with our mediator. It's with the Lord Jesus Christ. God saying to his son, if you do this, if you live perfectly according to the law, if you fulfill this, if you do, then I will bless them. There's a big difference, you see. So this is very important truth. The new covenant was made with the mediator of the new covenant, with our Lord Jesus. Unlike Moses, under the Old Covenant, Christ takes your place, and he represents you, and he lives out and fulfills all the requirements of the law on your behalf, 
and he purges you of your guilt and of your sin. He teaches you as a prophet. He's ongoing ministry of teaching and instructing and giving wisdom. It comes from him. He defends you as a king. He protects you. In other words, he is through and through our Savior. That's who Christ is. And we need to understand that those who are included in the new covenant will not be able to break this covenant because God didn't make it first and foremost with you. He made it with your mediator. And that covenant will never be broken. And you can't break it. And God will never stop caring for us like he actually did with many under the old covenant. It says right up there in the few verses before that in, in verse 9 that it said they broke his covenant and he, he stopped having regard for them. So what we're about to see in these verses is how, how, how this is how this works. And it fortifies hopefully your faith and trust and can help you live in this land and in this city. It's knowing that God takes, takes action and makes these important provisions in this covenant this guarantee, this promise, and he's going to make sure that the failures and the weaknesses of that old covenant are, are done away with. So in these verses, we'll see that God makes also a lot of I will statements. He says, it doesn't say, if you will, then, if you will, it's I will, I will, I will, all through these, these verses. So it's important to keep in mind that there are no ifs in the new covenant. Is God saying, I will. So here in this text, I want us to see some important blessings in the new covenant. You may have to put your theological cap on a little bit, but we need good theology in our churches too, don't we? And really, these are four overarching blessings upon the lives of every person who's included in the new covenant. And all the other blessings fall under these four things. And I've, I've given the acronym RAID, to help you remember it. This is going to help you think through what I'm hoping to see in this summary is that how the Lord Jesus Christ accomplishes and takes care of these four most basic needs for our souls and for to accomplish our salvation. So I'm calling it God's Gracious Raid, R-A-I-D. And you'll see as we move through here what, what we're getting into, some of these doctrines. And it's this, it is the idea of a raid, not like, you know, the bug spray raid, which that might have a sermon illustration in its own. But this is, this is an invasive coming in of a stronger one into the devil's place and making raid and, and, and accomplishing great things. So, R, the first thing we're going to see in this text is regeneration regeneration. The first blessing, he says, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. Another I will statement. This is a sovereign work of God performed in the deepest, innermost part of who we are as human beings. It's a work done in the mind and in the heart. Those are important things. It has to do with your understanding and your affections. This is a, this basically he's giving us a new nature. A new nature. Notice God's laws are not coming down from a thunderous mountain with lightning bolts and people shaking and, and afraid and God saying keep them away this fiery mount Sinai with with all this threatenings handed down on stone tablets. No, in the new covenant it's different. It's it's from the sermon on the mount. Right? It, it's, it's, it's a work done also in the mind and in the heart. He, say, he says, I will put. Now that word put is a powerful word, full of meaning. It's a God will do this putting. He's going to put his laws into our minds. So all under the new covenant, everyone. Think, everyone is thinking now with a renewed mind real understanding part of, the, part of what Jesus taught it says he who understands those are the ones who will produce many fold more fruits this understanding so now we're thinking with renewed minds and we're agreeing we're agreeing with God's laws and not just the ten commandments yes we agree 
you shouldn't steal or lie or covet. You should honor the Lord. You, you shouldn't you know, commit adultery. All these things, we agree, but it's also, we're agreeing with all of God's revealed ways to live pleasing now to Him. We're no longer hostile to God in His ways, in our minds. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by the testing that you may what? Discern. Discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So now we understand, and now we agree and love God's laws, and we have a, with, this, with that comes a new power, a power you didn't have before. See, a lot of the devil's ways of binding us is through the mind and getting you to believe a lie, an untruth. Now you're captive. When you believe an untruth, you're captivated to that lie. That's how, I mean, we've driven through the city. We've seen just from the vision, out, outward manifestations, there are many captive to a lie in a false veneer in that sense. But now there's a new power to deal with sin. And this takes place in regeneration. Now you really can live pleasing to God. We have this new power to faithfully follow Christ with understanding. And God also says in this verse, I will write them on their hearts. So it's not just a head knowledge, not just a theology thing. It's an affection. It's, it's a dealing with your heart. I will write them on their hearts. This is precious truth. Right? We not only understand and agree with God's laws, but now... They're, they're written with the finger of God on our hearts. This is a new heart. You hear that kind of language from Christ, what it is to be born again. This is all in regeneration, being born again, this new heart. Law is written on your mind. Law, writ, law of God written on our heart. This is regeneration, and it's a sovereign and powerful work done by the Holy Spirit in us. We now love his laws. See, he does not need permission for you to come in and do this. But now we can. We can sing with the psalmist, Oh, how I love thy law. It's my meditation all the day. So it's because of regeneration, we now have these new desires, these new affections that come from the very depths of who we are, the center of who we are. And this is those in the new covenant. They're no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit born from above all those in the new covenant are born again and it says Romans 8 is the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law indeed it cannot those who are in the flesh cannot please God so here's the first thing our mediator our savior of this new covenant is the one who solves the problem of our original hostility towards God. That's the gold nugget. He solves the problem of our original hostility towards God. And in him alone do we find this power now to overcome sin. We no longer enslave to sin. And the gospel in this new covenant, the good news, it does not set us free just to live however we want, right? Just live reckless, foolish, sinfully so that grace may abound? No, no, no. It frees us now to obey God. We, we obey from the heart the standard of teaching to which we've been committed. We, we now conform to his laws and his ways from a right understanding and from a willing heart. This is his work. He gets all the praise for this. This isn't something you work up or can create. This new heart and regeneration. Prophet Ezekiel spoke of that. I will give you a new heart, and I will, I'll, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. See, my law. I'm going to cause you to walk in it and, and be careful to obey my rules. We're not slaves and robots that are meant, to, we're those that are, who are in love with our Father now. So what's happening is God's performing this internal work in us that's going to meet our deepest need and transform our entire lives. 
will no longer be an offense to him. That's a big deal. And will no longer be a target for his wrath. Because that's what the unregenerate are. A man from the 1600s, a theologian named John Owen, he said this. Listen to what he said. He said, For God could not approve of and rest in his love towards us while we were enemies unto him. That makes sense. And he said, Nor could we find rest or satisfaction in God whom we neither knew nor liked nor loved. So God takes care of this problem, and he works this in our hearts and in our minds. And there will be levels of immaturity, right? We're not talking about sinless perfectionism. There will be growth, opportunity for growth. But this is the new trajectory, okay? Regeneration. What's the next one? Notice next, the passage says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So this leads me to the second blessing, namely... Adoption. Adoption. I could say acceptance. That's true, but it goes deeper than acceptance. This is, this is adoption, the doctrine of God's adoption. It's all right here in Romans 8 and in other places, but it, really right here, he's touching on it. This adoption has to do with our relationship with God. And this new and saving relationship has been established by and through our mediator, Christ, through his son. In, in the old covenant, there was an external relationship with the people of Israel, right? And that relationship, though, did not guarantee the salvation of anyone. Even though you're among the people of Israel, it did not mean you have that saving relationship with God. Many did, but you also see many didn't. Korah, we, Ron and I were talking about this morning, Korah's rebellion against Moses. I mean, Korah and these guys were some of those who crossed the Red Sea with Moses. They were fed in the wilderness, yet they rose up in rebellion. You know, the Apostle Paul addresses it in Romans 9 briefly when he said that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. That caused them to stumble, as he said, over the stumbling stone. They stumbled. And in Hebrews 4, we're told that they hardened their hearts and could not enter God's rest. Why? Because of unbelief. That mother of all sins, unbelief. We're told also that they did not continue in the covenant, that old covenant. Well, in the New Covenant, this relationship is truly a saving one. All in the New Covenant are, are under this saving relationship because of what the Lord Jesus accomplished on our behalf and because of his death on the cross. It accomplishes it. How was that covenant sealed, signed, sealed, and delivered? Completed from the blood of the cross. That's where it was. And so... Right here, it's God's promise to Christ, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Notice the words theirs and mine. It's showing this aspect of belonging to, together, and it's like a family belonging. A father will say, that is my daughter, and I am her father, and that is my son, and I'm his father. And the Lord Jesus talks like that. I want you to know uh, that, that God is my Father and your Father. He's my God and your God. And he has reckoned, that's what Christ, the mediator, our Savior, has done. He's reconciled us to the Father. So what that includes in this new covenant is being added to his family. Adoption. Some of you may have adopted some. Some of you may be adopted. We know what adoption is. By good parents that really adopt, they bring them in like they're their own. And who makes all the deciding about that? The kid, does the kid decide they want to be adopted to that family? Hey, I like that family in that nice house up there. I want to, no, it's the parents who, who do it and pour out their hearts and they are now fully in the family. They bring them in by mercy, by grace. 
So all of sin kinds, or all of mankind's sin, sinful man, their biggest problem wasn't necessarily that they're hostile to God, but that they're alienated from God. That they're cut off from Him. Like Paul told the Ephesians, the Gentiles who, who don't believe, they are without hope and without God in the world. So a lost person really is a trespasser. And not only a trespasser, like you've gone onto someone's property, uninvited and un unwelcomed, that's trespassing. This is God's world. And you're also a transgressor. Not only did you overstep the boundary line as a trespass, but you've transgressed. You've sinned. You've robbed. You've broken laws. You've done wrong. You've offended the owner. That's how, that's how people are with God. Everyone. Now, the miraculous blessing for all who are in the New Covenant, is that the Lord Jesus Christ brings us into this family, into this the most glorious family. The church family is the most glorious family on earth. We all have the same father. We call each other, we call each other brother and sister because we're family. There's a reality to it. I feel a connection with some of you brothers that I've met over the weekend. Like I, I've known you for years. Like There's something I know about you and can relate to and love about you. That's because of the reality of the Spirit dwelling within us. And when God gave His only begotten Son, He gave us His very heart, right? His most precious possession. He gave us His everything. It's the perfect, the perfect means of peace and reconciliation with Him. He gave it all. The Father gave Him. So our status of trespasser and transgressor and enemy of God all changes in Christ in our great mediator and what he has accomplished in sealing and completing that covenant the apostle John don't you love John's gospel and even right out at the beginning of, of John 1 12 he says but to all who did receive him who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God who were born talking about regeneration now not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So he gets all the glory. No one can boast about this, right? In Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17, towards the end of John, what a glorious glimpse into this, this prayer. The Son is praying to the Father in this high priestly prayer. He says, he prayed, I, I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That, that is beyond our imagination. That's what I say. How can, we, how can we understand the value of what we have in Christ? In this new covenant, God has made us his own and he has given himself to us. Isn't that incredible? And he loves us right here. The John 17, guarantee you, the Father's going to answer that appeal of the Son. That's what he wants. That he loves us with the same love with which he loves Jesus. He loves his adopted sons and daughters with the same love with which he loves his natural son, Christ. That, and you get to be in on that love. I mean, doesn't that make you want to just flee sin? And the things of the world that, that do damage to this great relationship. See, this is all a blessing for her, those who are in the new covenant. I mean, to simply be allowed into the presence of a holy God without being destroyed is staggering. But to be adopted by him as your father who loves you with the same love with which he loves Christ and be at peace with him and have this full access now into his home, it's simply beyond any blessing we can imagine. You're, for him to no longer be against you, but for you, if God is for this church, you guarantee you this church is going to thrive and survive. He may come, you may come through some desert seasons, 
but you can guarantee you he's going to uphold you and keep you. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's for you now. All right, what's the third blessing? What, what would the I stand for? It stands for illumination. This is the doctrine of illumination. He says right here, it says, And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. So he's, he's, Christ solves the problem of our hostility towards God with a new heart. He solves our, pros, our problem of alienation by adopting us into the family. And now he's, he solves the problem of our blindness to God by illumination. See, at the very beginning of Christ's high priest, priestly prayer also, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that, they, that the Son may be glorified, that may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you. They know you. The one only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this is what he's saying. All who are in this new covenant will be blessed with this illumining knowledge of God. A true revelation. We truly know God. And how's that possible? How can you know your God's the true God? Or how, how can you know? How is that possible? It can only be possible by God taking the initiative and making himself known to you. No one else can teach us this knowledge. No one. Not this. Right? And, and Matthew says in 11.27, the Lord Jesus says in Matthew, no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Those are those who know God, the real God. If, if God doesn't do that, if Christ doesn't do that, then we can't know him at all in this saving way. This is the role of the mediator. We would end up, humankind, we would just end up making up our own ideas of God or what God's like or who God is. And what's that? That's idolatry. That's false religion. But that's not what we have. The teaching that took place in the Old Covenant won't be the same, as he's saying, as in the New Covenant. There's going to be this real illumination. And what does that mean? They said they won't teach them to know God, know God, know God. What, what, how did that develop? How did that even happen? What is that talking about? It was historical tra trajectory of the Israelites. Joshua led Israel to the promised land, remember? After Moses, he led them, delivered them. Great things happened. The walls of Jericho, they took the land. And we're told in Judges, though, after Joshua, Judges 2.10, that there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. It's sad, but this is the, the, the biblical reality, the history. They did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Well, that's part of the history of this. And then long after even David rose up, there was a, there was a, a reformation and a, a, just a, a complete revival, right, of true truth. The Psalms were penned, but then there's another decline. And there, was, there are good kings and bad kings, remember? And there was one good king named Hezekiah, and in his day, there was a prophet named Hosea. And Hosea was be being grieved with this same thing, that when he said in chapter 4, verse 1 of Hosea, there is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. This is what happened. This is part of the Old Covenant. And... This is, this is what he's saying. is It's a national knowledge. It's a national knowledge among the people of the Old Covenant. A generational knowledge. And it's different in the New Covenant. That's what the author's saying. This is different. You can't go back to that Old Covenant. Hebrews is a lot, says a lot about that. You've got to keep going. 
Well, after this prophecy from Jeremiah was given, the Jews went into this captivity in Babylon. Jeremiah talked about that. He said, this, this nation's done. Like, they're going to get kicked out. You're going to spend all this time in Babylon. And, but yet, he gives this glimmer of hope. There's a new covenant coming. He gave them something to latch on to. But th- during that exile, and after this prophecy of Jeremiah, they began this intricate, the religious leaders, this intricate, perplexed way of teaching that afterwards they were completely addicted to. And these teachings started to come out in what's called the Mishnah. I don't know if you know much about the Mishnah. And you may have heard how they take the law of God, but then they have all these other rules, like 600 plus. You can't eat an egg from a chicken that laid that egg on the Sabbath. It's weird stuff. Well, th- all these things, the inter- this was their interpretation of the law. And or it, it's them saying to no, one another, eventually, know the Lord. This is how you know the Lord. And it was just a big, confused mess. Again, Owen, I, I love reading John Owen. Some of these old guys, they had such insight, didn't they? He said this, this was such a bewildering thing regarding the Mishnah. For, he said it's such an operose, laborious, curious, fruitless work that there's not another instance to be given of in the whole world. He said, there is not one single doctrine or precept of the law taught with clarity, but it's filled with so many needless, foolish, superstitious questions and determinations is that it is almost impossible that any man in the whole world of his entire lifetime should understand any of it or guide his course or guide his life by it. He couldn't do it. So these were the burdens that the Pharisees were placing on their shoulders of the people, that they're utterly weighed down by these things. It gives some light into why Jesus would say things like, Come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See that? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And isn't that good news? This is our mediator. This is our Savior. Or, or John 6, where, where Jesus says, It's written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Not these religious leaders who are bringing about a confusing mess. They will be taught by God. This is part of the new covenant promise of illumination. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So let this precious truth and blessing help you. You know God. You know God. Your pastor knows God. So he, he knows his word. He's teaching his word, studying, preparing. And this is what we're talking about. He's, God's made himself known to us in Christ, in his gospel, and in this covenant. It, it, it's not that you found him, but he sought you out right and found you and you're being taught by God as a loving intimate father teaches his precious child each one of you he he wants to teach as a treasured child we were once blind but now we see that's illumination this is enlightening we were blinded by the devil and sin to keep us to keep us from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Look who all this includes in this text, in the New Covenant, from the least to the greatest. Everyone. Everyone. What grace. Every single person has this saving knowledge of God. It's down to every individual who has faith in Christ. This knowledge is in the heart and in the mind. It's in us. It's not just in the Old Covenant. Who was it that could go into the temple? The priests. And only the high priest once a year into the inner room of the temple, the Holy of Holies, and only once. It's not like that anymore. That was just a shadow and a foreshadowing of what we have in the new covenant. Everyone has access. Christ has opened up the mercy seat. 
Mercy seat was what was the name of that lid on the ark. You know, the, the high priest would come splash blood on the ark in there and bring incense and do it. You have access to the real mercy seat as a child, as, as one in the new covenant. Adopted, illumined, regenerated with a new heart. Not just the priest, but everyone. So it, it's no longer teach like it's like you don't need to be taught who your mom or dad is if you're in this family you know them you don't have to be taught that that's kind of what he's saying with you and God you know him you don't have to say that anymore no longer know the Lord know the Lord you better listen to me so you can know the Lord no he teaches us every single child in the family knows their father or mother right so, but this doesn't mean Christians don't need ongoing teaching, right? Or, or, or teaching on the things of God. Otherwise, why is this author writing the letter to the Hebrews? Or, or why do we need pastors and teachers? Why did God give pastors and teachers? No, we still need that. It's not, but he's not saying we have a full, complete knowledge of God. What he's saying is we have a true, saving knowledge of God. And we learn to grow. We grow in this knowledge of the Lord. That's part of Christian maturity and sanctification and growing in grace. All right. The last one, the D, stands for deliverance. So every generation, adoption, illumination, and deliverance. I'm hoping the, the, the acronym is helping you remember these fundamental doctrines. I mean, these, these encompass all your problems in life. Your, your biggest problems, which are with God, solves them all. Deliverance. Right here in the text. All who are in the new covenant, this is, this is full deliverance. He says, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Wow. So Jesus solves the problem of our guilt before God. He solves the problem of our hard heart and mind. He solves the problem of our alienation and separation. He solves the problem of our ignorance and stupidity, right, and idolatry. And now he solves the problem of our impending judgment, of our guilt. He solves it. He is our deliverer. He is our savior. Our sins are the big problem, the biggest problem we have that have eternal consequences. Before any other blessings can come to us, our sin has to be dealt with. And this is why this covenant is a mediated covenant, because we can't deal with it or purge our sins. We can't do it on our own. That's why it has to be a mediated covenant. It has to be done for you on your behalf, and Christ can, and he did. In, in this way, the author calls this a better covenant. You have a better covenant, you have better promises, you have a better hope, you have better sacrifices. It's just better. And that's what the Hebrews reads like. A better covenant. God has promised to be merciful towards our iniquities and to remember our sins no more. Do you, do you know why they had the weekly offerings and sacrifices and then the annual day of atonement sacrifices year after year week after week it was to remind you of your sin that you remember your sin and what's he saying because of the lord jesus christ our savior our champion our true sacrifice he's not going to remember our sins anymore and now it's all because of him that god's chosen to be eternally merciful to us our iniquities. This is the covenant promise that Christ has secured and accomplished for us. God will show us mercy and not deal with us according to what we deserve. The psalmist said, if, if he should mark our iniquities, if he should mark our iniquities, who could stand? No one. Right? Iniquities, plural, if he should mark one of them, you can't stand. Again, this is why we this covenant has to be a mediated covenant with a savior for you. It's all of grace. But he doesn't mark our iniquities. 
And that's the best of news. How does an omniscient God, I don't know, forget our sins? I mean, you you puzzle over this and think, he won't remember? Does that mean he forgets? I I really don't know. He he doesn't say how. He doesn't explain the how. He explains the that. This is the case. And it's in the covenant. It's in the covenant. I'm not just going to, I'm going to write it down. That's what a covenant is. It's like a will, right, or a testament. I'm going to write it down, and I'm going to write it not just on paper right here, the new covenant, but I'm going to write it on your mind and in your heart. What does it say about God? I mean, he wants you to really have peace. He wants you to really be free and encouraged and feel accepted and loved by him. And that enables us to love others. And love a lost city, doesn't it? He's not going to remember your sins. When you die someday and you go stand before the judgment seat, if you're a Christian, if you're trusting this mediator, this Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, not one sin will be brought up in remembrance for your judgment towards you. Not one think that's getting at what it means. He's not going to bring anything up that you've done sinful in your lifetime. You're trusting Christ. He's your Savior. I won't remember. I won't bring up a single thing. Welcome to your home, and you'll know your home. It will feel like home like no other home you've ever lived in. This is where I belong, fully accepted. All through eternity, not a single sin Your little one or your big ones won't ever even be brought up or remembered forever. That's just, that makes my heart sing. That's that's the gospel. And there are a lot of sins in this room and in this city, but this is the sin forgetter in the gospel. So y'all have this gospel, and this is what you can tell people, this raid mentality. He simply won't count our sins against us or hold them against us. They've been completely atoned for on the cross. They carried with them all this debt, remember? He said that record of debt has been washed away, nailed to the cross. So I need to close, but I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope that all who are trusting in Christ as their Savior, that they, they're finding strong encouragement to press on, to hold fast, to hold fast to their confession, your confession of faith in this Savior. Because of Christ and what he's accomplished in his perfect life, in his suffering, in his perfect life, in his death, he's conquered, in his resurrection, he's conquered death. He destroyed death. He's the death destroyer, right? God has promised in him to regenerate, adopt, illuminate, and deliver all who who trust in him. And this is what I'm calling God's gracious raid. And I I hope that he will raid this city, because he can. There's nothing that can stop him. It's like maybe this church and, you know, the, the church, Dan Emma and those others, there are others around. Maybe they are the leaven. Once leaven gets in a lump of dough, there is no getting it out. You know that? It permeates, and it starts going to work. There's a power in it. And so may may you all be a holy leaven in this city of Portland and and press on, saints. Amen. What What a deep and abiding joy and peace we have for all who believe in Christ this mediator of the new covenant. Amen. Let me pray. Oh, Father, I do pray now that you will bless your people with these truths, cause your word to land with power, affect the heart and mind, and strengthen faith, encourage people here. Perhaps some need to be awakened. So I pray that you would you would move in power through the truth. Thank you for that we have the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. We love you. 
We pray now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.